Aloha and welcome to Figments, the power of imagination. I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I want to wish a happy Hanukkah to our viewers and uh, say that I had a great Thanksgiving with my family and I, we have a lot to be thankful for. That said, today's topic is kind of a heavy one, uh, but it's worth talking about because you can't just wish problems in the world away. And hopefully this one will be a topic that our viewers, especially those in Hawaii, but elsewhere as well, find thought provoking and maybe inspiring to take some action. And I'll give some examples of that in a bit because today we're going to talk about imagining Hawaii during a China-Taiwan conflict and a little more elaborations coming. But first I have to uh, introduce my guest and great friend, Colonel retired U.S. Air Force Ed Hawkins, aloha Ed. Aloha, Pig. Hey, it's, uh, it's great to have you here, folks. Ed is... Uh, He's a remarkable guy. You got people who are gla glass half full, glass half empty. Ed's a very balanced, the glass is half full and half empty sort of a guy. And I see that on the golf course where he suggested this topic. He is a, was a career Air Force intelligence analyst, attended the Air Force Academy, uh, coming from his roots as an adopted son of a military family there on the left, you haven't changed much, Ed. <laughs> I look at that picture. Still it, that it, dinky guy, huh? <laughs> yeah, interesting thing. Uh, Alejandro saw that and said, he looks like your dad. And your face, I'm not kidding. It, it is. I'll have to bring a picture of my dad. There are some uh, common characteristics there. But that you then attended the Air Force Academy um, and uh, graduated made it all the way to Colonel, retiring from APCSS, one of our favorite places, I think we both agree. Yeah. And uh, had a really remarkable career. He also studied uh, postgraduate education at Harvard University. I'd like to point out that those are two institutions that would not have admitted me and didn't, the Air Force Academy <laughs> turned me down, but I have spoken at both of them. So I guess after the fact, better than me, grew, grew <laughs> into it. Um, after the Air Force, you served the community as the president of the Japanese America Society Hawaii for, geez, nine years, something like that, right? Seven, yeah. Seven, okay. Probably seemed like nine at times and like three at others. <laughs> and uh, then you joined uh, city government, not politics. I don't think of you as a very political guy. You have your opinions, but. Uh, you worked for Mayor Kirk Caldwell as his executive director of economic development. And in that role, that had kind of a diplomatic uh, piece because you worked the um, sister city program. And I think you got a picture of you here with the mayor of Tokyo and the mayor of Honolulu. Then you also worked with cities in Taiwan and China, which had to be an interesting basis for comparison. Yeah. Um, not the topic for today, maybe a future episode, mm -hmm. but uh, you're an active guy. I gotta gotta share that with the viewers. You're a boater, a biker, and of course a golfer, and a really good golfer. Probably the best golfer in our weekly group, the Gaggle. Oh here's 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 Lydia. No strokes, Go, here's Lydia Go <laughs> asking for your autograph, as I understand it. Um, hey Ed, why don't you tell me about your hole in one? <laughs> What, what hole was that? Uh, was oh, that's that right. Two, I have a hole yeah, in one yeah. and you don't. You're a much better golfer, but I have a hole in one this year and you don't. Number two, so, wasn't it? Yeah, it was number two. February 6th, 179 yards, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> You've heard me say it, uh, tell the story many times. Um, all to say, Ed is a very well-rounded, complete human being, very thoughtful. And he's just the guy to help me imagine the unimaginable. And that's what we're kind of doing today is looking at what it would mean for Hawaii if China took military action against, um, against Taiwan. And we don't have to presume that there would or would not be a US defensive response actually committing forces to such a fight, uh, because either way, uh, the effects are going to be profound. So let's start with our assumptions and just say, it is possible, the words of Xi Jinping no one should underestimate the Chinese people's staunch determination, firm will, and strong ability to defend national sovereignty and territorial integrity. And for him and for the Chinese Communist Party, that means a reunification of Taiwan. Not the issue to be debated, 
but it is possible. And our acknowledgement of the possibility should inspire us to think about what would happen and be better prepared for it and participate not just in the preparation, but the political process that determines the policies our nation follows. So buckle your seatbelts, folks, and let's talk about, um, about a tough topic. Ed, uh, since it's possible, imagine, if you will, that China invades with relatively short notice Taiwan. We'll just use the invasion as the nature of the military action. What happens first? Are we under a threat? Are we going to get attacked? Is our first warning going to be a missile strike on Honolulu? Yeah, well, you know, as you as you pointed out, the, the um, we have to think about the possibilities from uh, direct attack to something uh, less than that, uh, which will impact us. But um, if there is, and I and I guess you know we can leave it up to experts to talk about exactly how that would uh, happen. But uh, there is a possibility, you know, it could be a fait accompli. It's not too far away. Um, the Chinese have, have built up their military. They have a huge uh, short range and medium range uh, missile uh, capability, you know, thousands that they could overwhelm uh, command and control, uh, air bases, logistics ports. They could have sa uh, saboteurs and agents already in place. You know, there, there are things Absolutely. that they could do that um, we might be faced with a, a fait accompli. Uh, I and hope I, that doesn't happen, but the possibility is there. The capability yeah, I, of the Chinese are significant, yeah. I agree, I, and our purpose, as we talked about before the show, is not to scare folks, it's to just make them think about this and recognize the importance, especially of deterrence. And in my mind, I'm most concerned about the advances in Chinese missile and nuclear weapon yeah. capability. Yeah. They're growing their nuclear arsenal from 200-ish to And thousand. here in Hawaii, Fig, you know, uh, the odds of a direct attack is, is not hot. I don't think it's high, you know, that even yeah. if there was a conflict, extension of uh, conflict to the rest of the United States, uh, of course, Guam is part of the United States. And, right. And that's very close. And you might talk about that later. We have, mm -hmm. uh, as you know, bases in Japan. Uh, we have uh, relationships with uh, Philippines, with uh, Australia. So they are within, in Korea. So they're within range or mm -hmm. uh, areas that could could be uh, involved in, in some sort of a, a conflict. But direct attack on Hawaii, I think most experts would agree that it's unlikely, but miscalculations, you know, those things can mm -hmm. happen. Uh, we have a uh, Indo-Pacific Command Headquarters here, you know, the overall commander of the region, uh, plus all the uh, military services are headquartered here. Uh, we don't have significant forces here, but as you know, this is the air bridge for any kind of right. forces moving forward into East Asia and the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, we have significant facilities for fit, uh, ship outfitting, repair, Shipyard, you know, yeah. all those things. So uh, it's possible. It is very possible. I think that's- And I don't think those- use. Uh, Yeah, I don't think there's anything about that that um, means we're asking for it. Uh, are those facilities are placed here because of where the islands were placed and it makes strategic sense. Um, to me, when I look at the Chinese developments, uh, and I can't read their minds or uh, deduce their intent, but if I had to guess, because I can do that, uh, I'd guess that what is most likely is that they would use that threat uh, of attack as leverage to have the freedom to do what they choose to do with regard to Taiwan. I think in either case, whether we're deterring adventurism military adventurism against Taiwan or deterring attack on Hawaii, a key is preparation. You know, we went through that January 2018 missile attack false alarm. I'm sure you remember it. Um, and one of the things that came out of that was that the state stopped testing the missile part, missile warning or attack warning part of the siren test. That's the first Monday, right, of every month. At, at, 45. I know when it, when it happens, it'll remind me every month. And frankly, I think that was a mistake. The reason we had that error, as bad as it was, as scary as it was for everybody, 
was because the state is the only one in the union that was taking the potential of attack seriously. Now we're closer than most, but um, the state was doing a good thing. They didn't do it well that day, but that doesn't, to me, mean you should stop. What are your thoughts on that? Well, uh, yeah, again, alarmist, you know, you, you don't want to be alarmist. And uh, I think with plenty of preparation and telling the public about how mm -hmm. this is to be done, uh, the other part is the number of tourists, of course, during that time, uh, where we weren't in the pandemic, so the numbers were very high. And uh, I doubt that very many understood, you know, what the significance of a test was. So uh, there were a lot of misunderstandings. I think preparation and uh, uh, communicating to the public uh, before reinitiating, I think that would be appropriate. Yeah, well, I'd like to see the next whomever. I'd like to see somebody take that step again in a thoughtful, non-provocative, non-frightening way. Just say, hey, we're, we are protecting our citizens. That's our job. Um, a question that came in in the preparation for this show is, does the state, and it was regarding the January 2018 uh, false alarm, does this, in, since you worked in city government and, and in the military here, uh, does the state even talk to the federal military? Are there, is there coordination between the services? I know the answers, but you're the guest, so I'll let you. Well, th there is the Department of uh, Hawaii State Department of Defense. General Hara, yeah. you know, runs that mm -hmm. office. And um, I know during the pandemic, for example, you know, there were very close coordination uh, with the military headquarters. Mm -hmm. uh, on the city side, the mayor does meet with uh, commanders uh, of all the services to discuss uh, mutual issues. So there's... There's a healthy level of communication, uh, channels that are open, and they do uh, take, make use of that uh, often. Yeah, I, I think they probably do that better in Hawaii than anywhere else I've been stationed. Now, some of that is circumstances or proximity to potential threats, but also the fact that we have the higher headquarters and all of the military services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Space Force, we have Space Force presence, and of course mm -hmm. the Coast Guard, not part of the Department of Defense, but they're all here and that makes it easy. We have an actively engaged community organizations like the Chamber of Commerce's Military Affairs Council, all enhance communication. My answer to that question, just to reinforce yours is yes, they do communicate. Is there room for improvement? Yes, and should they be uh, considering this possible impact of a China-Taiwan conflict. Absolutely. They probably are. They certainly should be. Plus, remember so, that we do have a significant diplomatic corps, the consuls, generals, yeah. the big seven that I call, you know, um, Korea, Japan, um, Philippines, Australia, New Zealand, Marshall Islands, and of course, Taipei Economic and Cultural Office, which is a, mm -hmm. like a de facto consulate. Yeah, as we as I was getting ready to come on the air, I, I was thinking I need to get somebody from the consular corps to talk about the unique diplomatic presence in Hawaii. And that could have impact on our role with the potential non-combatant evacuation operation for not just U.S. citizens. We'll come to that in a bit. But first, let's talk about another area, and you alluded to it earlier, where we could see some disruption if, if this worst case were to happen. And that's cyber attack. Now, we th might just think of a cyber attack affecting the military headquarters. They hack their classified email or you know, mm -hmm. disrupt the services. It could have a broader effect on the community than that, couldn't it? Yeah, I think so. If there is any kind of potential for a conflict or, or emergency, uh, I think we can expect uh, the enemy, the adversary, the Chinese, uh, to take not the enemy now, but if they, yeah, in, in that area, you know, and right. it would be uh, military infrastructure, you know, there's significant infrastructure here that serves both the military and the civilian side, you know, uh, we can expect, um, uh, I think, maybe not um, a direct heart attack on, on the targets here, but there could be agents and provocateurs that are here, you know, mm -hmm. acting. And uh, they, they may be uh, trying to affect some of the uh, uh, logistics and uh, uh, 
uh, the, the communications system to support all of our daily lives. So I think it's it's a possibility. We just need and it could to could touch daily life in a, in an insidious way. You might see um, uh, misinformation campaigns, as we've seen from foreign operatives in the past, uh, yes. trying to foment panic um, or some other reaction that they think would serve their purposes. Uh, a broader disruption. If you like banking and using your uh, debit card at the a or the ATM or pumping gas, it might be a problem because all of those services could be disrupted. And there's even a potential for significant disruption of the power grid. Why am I saying that? Not to scare you folks. This would be really bad and it's worst case, but I think it reemphasizes the need to provide an effective deterrence to cooperate with China when we can and compete with them when we must, and uh, more on recommended ways to do that. Um, here's a really tough one. You know, when uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941, neither you nor I were on active duty yet, just to keep that clear with the audience. Um, the islands were placed within hours under martial law and stayed under martial law until October 1944. And uh, folks, if you think that COVID restrictions are onerous, you ain't seen nothing yet compared to martial law. Ed, uh, do you think Hawaii would be under martial law if there was a conflict on, on Taiwan? Well, I, like I said previously, the, the chances of a direct attack uh, here uh, but, yeah, but even if there conflict. weren't a direct attack, if there were significant agents, provocateurs, there was disruption and, and just a need to maintain order. Do you think that's an option in 2021? It's very different. I'm not than sure to, to the extent of imposing martial law, but something mm -hmm. that's restrictive. And I think um, uh, if, if there is quite a bit of activity, you know, known activity uh, in, in Hawaii, but um, uh, or potential for activity, but uh, I, I I think that there will be um, a cause for concern, and um, that brings in I think uh, the the other area that we have talked about, you know, of societal impact. Yeah. Um, let's that, let's save that broad societal okay. impact and your personal view for a little later because I I want to really okay. get in there but 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 uh, the martial martial law i'm i'm hoping that it doesn't happen but yeah. um something like that maybe maybe uh, heightened security it's it's not beyond the realm of possibility I think. all all the more reason for the state uh, city and federal governments to communicate and prepare together so they avoid that option because in our martial law the for example the state had a military governor for those that almost three year period. And minor offenses to major offenses were tried by a military co court that consisted of a single judge, usually without legal representation. This is an example of martial law. And there was an over 90% uh, conviction rate. It's not somewhere we want to go, I agree, Ed. And, uh, but you have to have another means to coordinate between state, local, and federal authorities maintain the order and, and address the real threats that are out there. Yeah, uh, I mentioned non-combatant evacuation operations. This is something you brought up uh, when we talked on the golf course. And um, it's something that you and I, having served overseas a lot, we both served in the Middle East and Asia extensively. And everywhere you go, whether it's a natural disaster or war, we have a plan to get the non-combatants out. Do you think we'd have to do any non-combatant evacuation operations from Taiwan in the event of this contingency? Uh, I would say almost certainly in one mm -hmm. form or another. It could be a small scale, could be large scale. It depends on what kind of conflict it is, but uh, uh, it, it will be chaotic. And, and we saw, you know, all the- In Afghanistan, absolutely. In Afghanistan. Yeah. But uh, planning goes out the first day, as you know, in the military, you know, you can have any great plan, but uh, no uh, plan survives first contact. No, no, no plan survives the first day. So it could be chaotic. Yeah. But I would say, you know, you mentioned the Americans there, the other uh, foreign nationals, 
Um, 13,000 Americans yeah. citizens, maybe there, many more dual citizens. There are also uh, uh, government uh, mm -hmm. people, you know, Taiwan government people. Uh, there could be businessmen from both sides. There could be scholars and others that may not want to stay there, you know, and they may want yeah. to flee and their family. Yeah. So there, there is a, I think, uh, a large number that needs to be considered. Uh, I'm sure that uh, Indo-Pacific Command and the others are planning for this, but um, no plan is going to survive the first day. And yeah. It could get pretty chaotic. And the the de decision would have to be made early for it to right. have half a chance of success. And, it's and the recipients just, of that, you know, um, yeah. where do they go? Deal. Where do they go? And and likely Hawaii would be one of the destinations. You know, we've had that in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. It could be other countries nearby, Guam, U.S. territory, possibly. Uh, there may be countries that may not want to accept non-combatant evacuation operations uh, because of their relationship with China. They may not want to jeopardize their relationship. You know, it'll be a national decision. So you can't guarantee that uh, if there is a NEO, that countries like Korea, Japan, uh, I hope they do, but uh, Philippines and the others uh, may not accept them. And uh, Yeah, well, they, the they have their own do. stake, as you know, right. Ed, with 13,000 or with 16,000 Japanese and um, mm -hmm. about 90,000 from Thailand and the Philippines were both treaty allies and, and half a million from Indonesia and Vietnam where we have important relationships. It could, it could be chaotic and three things we need to do. One, learn lessons from Vietnam and that evacuation of South Vietnam, uh, the more recent example in Afghanistan. And third, have the ability to make a quick early decision. Now, and how that, do we integrate yeah. them? Do we sell yeah. them here or is it just a waypoint for uh, going further? I, I don't know. No, those are the no. things that are have to be talked about. But if you live here in Hawaii and you don't have any interest in the military, it's still going to impact you because you're going to see a large mm -hmm. influx. And of course, our state population isn't that big. And uh, there'll already be plenty of demands on our infrastructure and supply lines. Uh, let's take a quick break, if I may, and talk about figments on reality coming up uh, a week from today. And that will be on December, uh, December 10th. I'm not sure that date's right. Whatever it is, next Monday. <laughs> I think I typed the wrong date in there. But uh, I don't have a topic yet, folks. And I trust that the news headlines will provide me a topic because they always do. So please join me. That's my non-vitriolic, non-political approach to current events. And I look forward to seeing you 10 o'clock Hawaii Standard Time right here on Think Tech Hawaii. Okay, Ed, back to our topic at hand. What would uh, what would conflict between China and Taiwan mean for the people of Hawaii and more broadly the people of the United States? Uh, you were the executive director for economic development, so you know a lot more about economy than I do. Tell me what you think would be the economic impact, and maybe compare it to the economic impact of COVID, bigger, smaller, who knows different over to you well things have changed if, if we're back in 2019 i think um, the scale would be different but um, uh, most certainly um, tourism will take a hit you know i don't think people uh, would want to come to hawaii if if there is a, a pending conflict or a conflict going on and may even be restricted Yes, so so that's that's uh, we've seen that at the beginning of COVID, uh, we may return to something similar to that. Businesses will be hit uh, hard, definitely. Um, I think the other part that we should be uh, concerned about is the trade with China. You know, it, it's a huge, huge um, economic uh, activity. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, during, you, you mentioned I was with the uh, mayor's office and right. I had a chance to go to China a couple of times and, and Taiwan once, but uh, I visited a place south of Beijing uh, called uh, Zhejiang, which is um, one of their claims to fame is the home of uh, the Shaolin Kung Fu uh, warriors. So we were bringing them over for the Honolulu Festival and we, we had it all in place before COVID. Hit. We hope to get mm -hmm. them back again. But one of the things I learned that Zhejiang region, um, 
they um, uh, manufacture 70% of all the iPhones uh, sold to the world. So, you know, those kinds of impacts overall to the United States and to the world in general will happen. And that, you know, that's just one area. Uh, and looking right. at Hawaii itself, um, although the trade uh, goods um, traded with China for, uh, between Hawaii and China is about 10% of the uh, annual product, gross annual product. So it's, it's not hugely, it's not a, a very high percentage, but still significant impact. Um, and the impact will hit hardest, I think, on the Chinese American community that have business and familiar relationships right, right. Uh, with, with mainland, you know, and it's not Taiwan as much as the mainland, uh, especially the coastal provinces where their families, uh, their, their ancestors came from. So it's going to hit them quite hard. Um, so yeah, and I, I, I would think, just go ahead. Yeah. So, so it's, it's really like a, a double whammy, you know, that overall economy and then the, uh, the specific Chinese American community and, and the businesses that they have and, in China. And the housing market, uh, a lot of Chinese investment, the Hawaii housing market, all of those are concerns. But one thing that concerns you and I, who both love Hawaii and love what is special about Hawaii and makes us the Aloha state, um, is the effect on the community and the friction, potential friction, bias, discrimination, um, reprisal against Chinese or Chinese American communities. As, as an Asian American, how do you look at that? What, how does that make you think and feel? Well, that's that's one of the ugly parts of America, isn't it? You know, in, in no, Hawaii, no. we're very fortunate. Uh, mm -hmm. You and I have been around the world, and I don't think there's anywhere else in, in the world that people get along. You know, different cultures get along so well as here. We're very fortunate. But, uh, you know, looking back into history, uh, there is a history of uh, this uh, discrimination rising up, uh, the uh, uh, what we misdirected patriotism that you you mentioned. Yeah, misdirected you know, people, patriotism. People think that aggression, by going after yeah. people that look dissimilar or like, uh, I'm sorry, similar to the enemy uh, or the adversary is, is a sign of patriotism. And we've seen where that leads. So I think we need to be very conscious of that. And uh, one of the things that, that I think that state and city uh, need to do is to reassure our Chinese American community. You know, they're, they're citizens, they're uh, patriotic, that uh, uh, recriminations against them uh, will not be tolerated and just, just uh, be conscious of that. Yeah, I was at a um, uh, ceremony uh, reception for the new USS Daniel K. Inouye. Um, ship, naval ship that's being commissioned on the 8th of December and home ported Pearl Harbor. And the line that sticks with me is they, they, the Japanese Americans had to fight to get the opportunity to, to fight for our country mm -hmm. because they were classified as, as enemy aliens, 4C classification. So, well, with all that cheery stuff, we're almost out of time. Um, so I have a portion, as you know, at what would Fig do? I'd like to kind of bounce this off you to what would Fig and Ed do? Um, the first thing I'd do is, is uh, have discussions that recognize that in the event of, of such a conflict, we need to retain who we are, not just as Americans, but as residents of the Aloha Strait. Another thing in my mind uh, is that we have to realize that giving in to China is not an option. Only the U.S. leading with allies and partners can uh, compel adherence to international norms and the rule of law. And there's a there's a dangerous rising tide of autocracy in the world. And we can't fuel that or it will change our lives in more ways than we've discussed today. So uh, we've got to diversify Chinese challenges militarily. From my background, I know we have continued to um, enhance missile defense characteristic. Any other quick hits of what our viewers should think and do in response to our not so cheerful po post Thanksgiving um, discussion. Well, to to be to be very understanding, you know, and yeah. uh, not not be uh, alarmed, but at the same time uh, be prepared and uh, think think about you know the contributions of the uh, Asians and and the Chinese Americans that are here 
and uh, make sure that uh, uh, we take care of them if there's any kind of conflict uh, or, or uh, any kind of emergency rises. The other thing I would like to just point out is uh, when you talked about the um, communication, you know, the, that mm -hmm. exists between the military, the city and state governments, businesses and so forth. We have a very good, I think, open dialogue. And one of the other strengths here, uh, as I mentioned, is the diplomatic core. And uh, there's smart people there. They're uh, professional diplomats. You know, they have uh, straight lines right to the uh, leadership of their countries. And, and these people should be included in, in any kind of dialogue. And in addition to the formal diplomatic representatives, we have numerous honorary consuls who, yes. Uh, yes. to various degrees, do in fact act on behalf of countries that don't have a consulate here or even an embassy. Um, and uh, they play an important role. And note to self, when I go to the consular core business meeting tomorrow, I've got to think about who I might get on figments to talk about the unique work Good of, point. The, <laughs> of the regular and honorary yeah. consuls. So it, it could happen, folks. We sh shouldn't build our lives around it, but we ought to think about it because the better prepared we are as a community and as a country, the less likely such a circumstance will be. And that's the purpose of this discussion. So thanks for joining us for that. I'd like to thank ThinkTech Hawaii, who allows me to put on both Figments, The Power of Imagination, and Figments on Reality, and uh, remember they're a 5013C or something like that, a nonprofit corporation, and they need your support. And it's a good time to donate because I'm very thankful for the fact that they enable us citizen journalists to express ourselves. Colonel Ed Hawkins, US Air Force retired. Thanks so much, brother. I'll see you on the golf course. Uh, thanks, Vic, and is thanks, Vic. Always Vic. valuable. Appreciate it. Enjoy Aloha. it. Aloha. Aloha.